Welcome to Between Two Barrels Podcast, live from Legend Studios. Between Two Barrels is a weekly podcast highlighting some of the legends across the state of Tennessee. From Dolly Parton to the elusive Tennessee wild man, from our head distiller to our legendary products and employees, this podcast will discuss spirits of all kinds here at Tennessee Legend Distillery. From country stars and cryptids to everything in between, we will talk about the life at a Tennessee distillery. Welcome back, Legends, to another episode of Between Two Barrels Podcast, and I'm one of your hosts, Opie, joined by b Brown himself, the regional manager, Brian Lowe. Brian, how are you? Doing well, doing well. How about you, Opie? Oh, not so bad, not so bad. It's a Monday, and we have a fantastic guest with us I've been very excited about because we are nearing October, my favorite time of month. It's the scary time of the year. Yep. It's it's my favorite Spooky time. Spooky season. Spooky season. So... We have Mike Howard here with us. Mike, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. If if I was, what does you say? If I was any better, couldn't stand myself. If I was any better, I couldn't stand couldn't myself. Couldn't stand myself. That's a, uh, uh, originally heard that one from Bob Hamill. Ah. Yep. Bob Finer any and better? frog hair. Finer and frog, Finer and frog hair. hair. Finer and frog hair split four ways. <laughs> Just add a little bit more to it. No, uh, yeah, as Opie was saying, it is getting to be what would be the spooky time of mm-hmm. year. We're into the burr months, as it were. Um, and if either one of us sound a little bit nasally today, uh, the, allergy the, season. The, the seasonal allergies are definitely kicking both of our rear ends right now. Tis the season to be stuffy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, as you go look around, we haven't even hit Halloween yet, no. and most all of the fall decorations around town have been pulled from store shelves, only to be replaced by all those Christmas decorations mm. already. And, and it seems like, and even going up and down the Parkway, they're getting all the stuff put up yep. on the light poles and everything else. So the because when it's eighty-two degrees outside, it feels like Christmas. That's Absolutely. what you're thinking is Christmas at that it's point. The first time. thing in my mind is Christmas. <laughs> is Christmas while it's still yes, eighty yes. plus degrees outside. Uh, but yeah, it is getting into the spooky time of year, uh, and we are de- devoting the entire month of October with the Between Two Barrels podcast, uh, as well as going ahead and taking the tail end of September mm-hmm. uh, to devote to the the things that are the the things that go bump in the night. Yes. Getting started with it, um, I guess. What actually got you into this? Uh, well, I'm the uh, I'm the case manager for East Tennessee Ghost Seekers. Yes, I have been for uh, for several years, and uh, what got me into uh, paranormal was uh, when I was about nine, ten years old. Uh, growing up in uh, in, in Texas, uh, there was a period of about four or five months straight where I would wake up in the middle of the night, um, completely awake, and it sounded as if there were it sounded as if there were seventy or eighty people in my room all talking. 70 or 80 people? Yes, just people talking over and over and over again in my room. Just just, just clear, distinct voices all speaking at the same time. Uh, waking me up as a kid, and I would, to the point where I would, it would, of course, the first few, few, first few times it happened, um, a little disturbing. Yeah. It would freak me out. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, I'd wake, i start screaming for my parents, my, my, my mom, my dad would come in the room, and I would just, they said I would stand there and tell them, please tell them to be quiet, tell them to shut up. Because uh, it just literally, and it wasn't people yelling or screaming or any weird thing. It was just literally people talking. As if you could imagine a room of, you know, 
70 or 80 people all speaking at the same time. Be- before uh, uh, the curtain goes up on, yeah. our, on our show, An before the, the MC comes out to get everyone started. Just but the, the weird thing is, all talking to you. Oh, oh no. just, directly just directly to you. To you. Oh, wow. Um, and that's and it went on for for several months, and it was it was pretty much a nightly occurrence. And it was always, usually sometime between two or three a.m. in the morning. Um, and it, it as quickly as it started, it just went away. Went away. Um, and I forgot about it for a long time, um, but it always was something that kind of sat in the back of my mind. And then as I got older, I started noticing um, if I would go places where, you know. I always had an affinity to go to places that were either labeled as haunted or, you know, had some sort of history or or, or mystery about them. Uh, And I was also always very, um, I was almost obsessed to the point of uh, of, uh, uh, of problematic as as I would go and find uh, murder locations. Okay. I was very, very interested with places people had died or died violently. Um, And I noticed that when I would go to these places that were haunted or I'd go to these places where they're had been some sort of uh, tragic occurrence, um, I would hear voices again, people speaking to me. Um, and only after you know so many years of, of, of experiencing that, it wasn't until I was in my 30s, almost in my 40s, where I started to realize, okay, I could actually kind of slow everything down and listen and, very, and pinpoint what those voices were and actually listen to what they were saying. Um, and for a long time, I thought, okay, either either there's something very wrong with me mm. um, or I have some kind of weird thing. Um, come to find out that my, both my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, and my mother uh, have kind of the same kind of thing. Um, Always for, been very, a lot more sensitive well, to... Well, what it is, it's... it's they, I've, I've now, now at the age of 53, have been told, oh, it's, it's you're empathic. You can mm-hmm. actually hear, you know, voices beyond the veil or... Uh, spirit voices, whatever you want to call them or believe that they are, I for some reason I can hear those things on occasion, and uh, and they tell me very strange things. They point me in very weird places. They take me, you know, sometimes they'll walk me through buildings and I'll find things that no one else has found before. Um, so yeah, that's what kind of drew me into. Okay, there's something else rather than what we got right here. Right. You know, and I think with everybody that's that's involved in any type of paranormal uh, investigation or paranormal field. Or, or our paranormal uh, experiences, um, it really all comes down to um, wanting to know more and simply fear of what happens after we die. Because mm. I think uh, you know the, the the human brain and the and, and, and the human body are such amazing machines and have so much energy and power to them. The thought of it just suddenly stopping and there's nothing else. I think a lot of people can't accept that. Right. So there has to be something more. Which is why over our history we've created things like, oh, we've got heaven, we've got hell, we've got, you know, we've got the afterlife, we've got, uh, you know, whatever it is you believe in or think it is, we can't accept the fact that if we die, that's just it, there's nothing yeah. Right. There's got to be something. Uh, so I'm sitting here right now as a person who's, you know, who, who's done this for, for 20 some odd years, uh, and have been to some very odd places, have seen some really unexplainable things. I can firmly tell you, do I believe there's ghosts in the air? I have no idea. Right. I don't know. Anybody who sits there in a parent, and, and, and I use that term paranormal field very loosely, um, because 99% of the people who are in the paranormal field, it's not a field. They don't make any money doing it. It's, it's a hobby. Uh-huh. It's something we do just because it's a passion that we have to do. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people try to place a lot of, oh, there's science and there's, no, it's, it's, we're trying to figure out answers to some, some things we can't understand. Uh, only um, in the cinematic sense is it yes. profitable. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that because I think the best and worst thing that ever happened to anything paranormal is, is television. Is the reality yeah. shows. And people went, oh, it's, it's this and it's. Zach Baggins is the worst thing to ever <laughs> to anything in the paranormal field, <laughs> bar none, hands down, across the I think board. a lot of people feel that way. Anybody who tells you they're a demonologist, please look at them, slap them in the face, and walk away, because they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I saw, there's nobody studying the field of, parent, uh, of demonology. No one's offering right. a, a degree in demonology. Yeah. There's no, there are no demonologists. And the people who say they're demonologists like Zach have no clue. What you, you've read about. a bunch of books. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, and you've read a lot of people's theories and, and ideas on stuff. 
it, it literally comes down to, okay, there's a lot of things that happen we can't explain, so we as, you know, the term paranormal investigators, we try to find out some sort of explanation, some sort of reason why why that door opens on its own, right. why you hear those voices, or why I suddenly walk into a place and I hear weird voices that can't be explained. Um, you know, the thing we normally, and the funny thing, especially now, uh, since it's become such a big thing on, on reality TV, and it's become such a, a you know a, an in thing to do. Let's let's go let's go let's go ghost hunting. Um, the only people making money off that are people that rent out their places to have investigations. Like I said, we don't get any right. money for doing this. We actually pay yeah. hundreds upon thousands of dollars to people. Can we come explore your place? Right. Can we come? You know. Can we come look at your asylum? Can we come walk through your? Can we come spend twenty four hours in your in your prison? We're, we're giving you money for the opportunity to come in to try to find any logical, scientific yeah. explanation that we wow. can as to why something occurred this way. Yeah. And whenever we can't explain it, that's whenever it's like exactly uh, what. And you're still left with that question. I mean, is it still some type of energy? Some type sure. of Remaining energy is this something that's that's uh, an intelligent energy versus a just a uh, like you said from so many traumatic sure. experiences, mm-hmm. uh, and and I'm someone who has watched these different shows and stuff like that. Of course, the entertainment value is there, but I mean there can be some informational stuff oh, sure. that you can take from these. Sure, uh, and just and realizing that there is so many different types of of things that while it can't be explained through science. Whenever there is still that question, what is it? You mm-hmm. know exactly what is it? Is it an energy that, like I said, is is a an intelligent or something that is being controlled, or is it something that is just a, 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 a remnants of of far gone, sure. you know, things, stuff like that? Sure, and and that's one of the things too. I mean, it's, you know, as much as I complain about Zach and and, and poo poo anything he usually <laughs> does, and that's the thing when you watch when you watch Ghost Adventures or any of those shows, you have to. Remember, that is television. Yes. It, yeah. is te- it is there for entertainment only. We have to do the same thing with the shows like Moonshiners and oh, stuff yeah. like that. Like, oh, yeah. We have to go in and say it's like, yes, the, the methods and stuff that they're using are, are the same methods that have been used for hundreds yeah. of years in this country as well as any other country. But there's no production company in the world that's going to pay the insurances to actually have these people transporting illegal alcohol sure. and, and selling it and stuff like that, so yeah. that's where that 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 production value yeah. winds up coming sure. in. And, and, in and the easiest way to remember that is a as as a as a layman or a viewer out there, is, as you watch the credits, look, there's actually a credit for writers, multiple writers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If it's reality, we don't usually have writers. You don't for need reality. writers for no. reality. <laughs> there are multiple writers for these reality shows that create these situations, create these characters, create mm-hmm. these. Plot lines because it has to be entertaining. One of the biggest, one of the biggest complaints about the show Ghost Hunters, the guys from Taps, the original uh, show, was that sometimes it was really boring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm here to tell you, after 20 some odd years of doing this, I spent more time literally sitting in a dark room with a bunch of sweaty guys and women going, "There's nothing happening." Right, and we get that for 12 hours. Yeah. We literally run through miles of tape and hour, endless hours of digital audio tape going, we have absolutely nothing. This is the most boring thing. Right. Ever. We've heard of all these stories we show, and then just buckets, nothing. There's more times that's happening mm. than we get stuff that you go, oh, my God. That's a-. But the thing is, we'll sit through thousands of hours of nothing to get that one second of, what the hell is that? Right. Mm. Oh, How for sure. And the, and the cool thing with a lot of what we've done you know, we have all these amazing pieces of equipment. We have all these incredible pieces of equipment. You can go on online now and, and spend tens of thousands of dollars buying these amazing ghost hunting machines and things. The majority of stuff that we've ever experienced ourselves was just when we would literally walk away, put all of our stuff down, have nothing running, and just go walk through a place. And suddenly something would happen, and we would sit there and experience it for 10, 15, 30 seconds, a minute or so, and then all of a sudden... Whoever was with us look around and go, did anybody have anything? No, we yeah. have nothing. Right. And then it just leaves you with amazing stories and amazing stuff to tell. That people go, oh, yeah, you're, right. you're, there's yeah. something wrong. How much were you doing? 
speaking of equipment, I see that you've actually brought a couple of different pieces of equipment I that did. is very I've, common. I, I, it's the number one question we get. What do we have to do to be a ghost hunter? You okay. have to get these two pieces of equipment, a gauze meter and a, uh, and a digital audio tape. Okay. That's all you need. You can, if, you have, if, you have a, if you have a gauze meter and a digital audio tape, you can do all the ghost hunting in the world because that's mm -hmm. basically what we all start with. And that's the majority of the stuff you find online, that's the stuff. It's basically some sort of variation of this. Right. Yeah. So, so going out, getting the thermal imaging and all that stuff, trying to sink hundreds of thousands of dollars straight if, off into it. If you've it. got five grand to drop on a thermal imaging, <laughs> go right ahead. More power to you. you go right Make ahead. Bezos more money you so go he can right, send that's another right. rocket. Amazon yeah. needs more. Of your yeah. money. Uh, but no, I mean, there's there are some great stuff out there. But literally, you know, the the gauze meter is an EMF detector. You turn it on, it tells you whether there's EMF feel the EMF presence somewhere. I'm sure with some of the wiring in this place, oh, yeah. it would wind up sending and off all and kinds of stuff. that's the thing I get with a lot of places. You'll, people go, oh, you know, I get, I get really bad headaches here, or I've seen this, I've heard this, I smell this. If you go into a place, especially uh, that's been wired from the 1960s on, 1980s on, uh, a lot of times the wiring is really, really bad. The shielding and the cabling is really, mm -hmm. really bad. Or it's old, or if it's if it's had any water damage, it's moldy, whatever it is, you get a lot of EMF. If you, if you subject anybody to high levels of electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic fields, it causes nausea. It causes hallucinations. What's the, the, the uh, uh, a box... Um, uh, your sensory overload. Oh yeah. yeah. What, what's the? It, it's a fear box or a fear cage. Yeah, yeah. It, it okay. It's what they call a fear cage, and that's basically high, high levels of EMF. Because I mean, I my wife is extremely susceptible to EMF. We were going to uh, investigate somebody's uh, apartment one time, and they had. I mean, we walked in and literally, without even touching the EMF to anything, we turned it on in the middle of a room, and they were hitting red. All all of our EMF detectors were hitting red. Going, okay, there's something wrong here. Well, we realized it was a back, she had the, the end uh, apartment in an apartment complex that was built in like 1975. It had been re-updated back in like 1989 or so. But the main panel where all the electrical was coming in for every apartment in this complex, there was one of those, you know, two level, like 40 apartment complexes, kind of an L shape over the complex. It was all coming in through their back window. The entire oh, wow. Back, the electrical panel was literally at their back window right next to their, their sink. And so we said, well, where, where do most of your occurrences happen? She says, well, in the bedroom and then they're in the kitchen. Right. And between the kitchen window and the bedroom window was this electrical panel that was feeding all 40 apartments. Wow. There was so much EMF in that room, in that whole apartment. It was a two-bedroom apartment. The minute we walked in, my wife walked in, and literally within 30 seconds, she goes, I have to leave. I said, why? She goes, I have a headache. I have a splitting headache. I've got to leave right now. And she went out and sat outside. Right. Because EMF, like I said, high, EMF, high levels of EMF will cause you to have ridiculous headaches. It will cause you to be nauseous. It'll, you'll see things. You'll hear things. You'll smell things. It's, it does an absolute 180 on your entire central nervous system at times because you have no idea really what's happening. It makes you confused. It makes you frightened. It makes you paranoid. It makes you scared. So a lot of the stuff that we do, especially in some of these homes and everything, and that's the other thing, we don't take a dime for any time. Anybody calls us up, hey, we have something, we'll go show up. We just try to help them out and see if right. they explain something to them. So we show up there going, okay, here, here's what's going on. And here's where you pinpoint stuff. This is why you saw this black thing crawling across the floor because you're literally standing in a fear cage right now. Yeah. But yeah, her, her apartment, her entire apartment was a ridiculous fear. With, and we said, okay, where's, where's everything happening? It's happening here and here. And that's where we were getting off the chart readings. On our gods and everything. It was, it was ridiculous. But, oh, it's, there you go. So what do you do when that happens? Do you get them to contact the so owner of the building? You your owner. Or, uh, and and in, in a case like that, the owner can't really do anything. It's, right, because of how, how lax building codes oh, yeah. were back in, like you said, the 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And whenever in that case, it's, the, the answer becomes, all right, we either have to get used to this or you mm -hmm. need to move. Right. Exactly. This is what's going on. You know? And like I said, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff we, we, we wander into, it's, okay, well, you're, the minute your AC kicks on, that causes this door on the other side of your house to slam shut. Right, yeah. and that's one of the ones that we have here, yeah. uh, having the big garage doors yeah. in the back. And then having the the barn door right yeah. over here, 
Someone opens suction. this front door and it just pulls it to. Yeah, ventilation systems are, are notorious for, for creating all sorts of paranormal activity. Mm-hmm. So. And that's something that just, depending on what time of year, I guess you'd have to be really particular in how you schedule investigations oh, yeah. uh, throughout the time of year to make sure that way it is a situation where you can shut these systems off we to try, where they're yeah, not. We, we try. We've actually, uh, there, was a, there was a local business uh, uh, in East Tennessee that were getting ready to open a restaurant. It was actually a former um, uh, funeral home before they turned it into a restaurant. And they wanted us to come do a walkthrough one night a couple weeks before they started doing this restaurant. The problem was they had already gone through and taken out all the doors and windows in the entire building. So in order for us to walk in there and just do audio tape, you can't really do any recording because there's so much noise pollution from everything Well, yeah, traffic coming through and everything. Yeah. So you can't do that. You really can't do a lot with, okay, well, if it's windy, then this stuff we got. There, there's really, it's, so it was one of those things where, okay, well, we can be here for a little while, but we're really not going to get anything. The only place we could do anything was downstairs in their basement and didn't really get a lot of anything in the basement because it smelled moldy. But that was like, and that yeah. was it. It's like, well, you know, we're sorry, but we can't really figure stuff out. That being said, there are a few times when we've done things in the middle of summer or in the middle of winter where things that shouldn't have happened happened. We were at a, uh, we were at a ranch house uh, in, uh, outside of Knoxville. And we've been there a couple times. We had some reports from the family that there was... Uh, the main thing that we notice, families will call us to come visit their homes when something happens to their children. And people will ignore it, they'll ignore it, they'll live with it, they'll be fine, but the minute something happens to their kids, yeah. oh, then for there's sure. something wrong. And I, you know, being, being a father and grandfather, I understand that. Um, and we had a, a case, that specific, a specific case, family was seeing strange things, the little, the little boy kept seeing an old man that would walk by the window every morning and stop him. So here's where you get the spooky part. The mother would come down the hallway at times and hear the little boy in his room talking to someone who was his, she they thought, imaginary friend. They thought that until the day they actually heard another voice in the room. Oh, ooh, ooh. Um, <laughs> and then when they open the door, there's nobody there. So yeah, you start going, oh, that's 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 the scene lifted right out of the exorcist. Yeah. Right. right. Um, you know, so we went to go visit. The strange thing was the three different times we went to go visit and spend the evening, as we started pinpointing more and more about what we could figure out, either where something happened or what it could have been, it kept pointing us to an outhouse, an, an, an outbuilding they had, basically a spring house. Um, like I said, it was a, a multi-generational uh, families had lived in this, uh, in this ranch house. They had it in their family for a little over 100 years. Um, and something kept pointing us to this spring house out back. Well, every time we would start to get our stuff to go out to the spring house, it would begin raining. And by raining, I don't mean just a little trickle, it would torrentially down the floor. And this was any time of the year that we were out there over the course of a year. Wow. It would be perfectly clear outside, perfectly fine. We'd plan it out to where there was nothing going on. The minute we would start, go, okay, we gotta go out to the, gotta go out to the spring house, we'd start to pack things up and it would pour. It would literally pour to the point where we couldn't move it. And it happened three different times. Huh. By the time we were finally able to get get out there, we got some very interesting stuff. Um, like I said, we use the EMF, we use the digital audio tape. There's there's one uh, there's a couple of pieces that you can get on your phone that I really like. Uh, we have a thing called an obelisk. If you watch any of the the ghost hunting shows, you'll see you'll see an obelisk. It's basically a spirit box. It's a little, little uh, electronic box that has about ten thousand word vocabulary and you turn it on it uses the surrounding energy and allows whatever spirit is there to pull words up on that box. Mm-hmm. Well Obelis, the folks at Obelis are fantastic. They actually made an app a couple years ago called iObelis. It's for the iPhone. It's free and it is actually an Obelis for your iPhone. Hmm. So you can download that to your phone. It works just like an Obelis. You walk around with it. I use it quite a bit. We use that. We also use something called the Necrophonic, which is a version of a spirit box, again, using white noise and and different stuff to allow spirits or whatever energy to create words and talk to you. With the the Necrophonic, um, you get a lot of conversations, a lot of voices. And again, it's coming through your phone, so you're going, okay, well, what's really happening there? 
I can't explain it. I know that I've used it on several, uh, when I would do some ghost tours and ghost walks, we would use it at times. I stood there and watched one night a uh, woman speak to her dead husband. She swore it was his voice. We heard a male voice coming through my phone. She carried a conversation with him for about three minutes. Wow. And he would answer back to her. So I, I can't explain it. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing. We had the necrophonic, we got it into the spring house, and we got a little girl's voice talking when she was asking why she was being put in the water. Mm. Oh. So the best we could figure out is that they, and they gave us a name, the best we could figure out, and we kept hearing two other voices that would come through, um, is that we think that there was a child that may have either drowned or had been drowned in this spring back there, and that's what was causing all these problems, and that was who the little boy was talking to. But again, and and then once you find those things, you have to try to go and find historical yeah. fact to, 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 uh, to at least give you some, some basis of reality. We were able to find a, uh, a gravestone with the name that was about a mile and a half from the house. Wow. And the age the age correlated to the same age the girl was when she died. And wow. No, couldn't find anything else, couldn't find out why she died, how she died, but that was enough. And once we found that out, um, to this day, as far as we know, the, the, the family's never had any more problems. Because hmm. you answered the question for them. We answered the question and we were able to, you know, I, I guess make contact with whatever spirit or whatever it was to, to put them at rest. Yeah. Some sort of resolution. Yeah. And, and that's, and, and a lot of what we do, like I said, we try to find, we try to find and help families to, and businesses, hey, this is what's going on. Here's an explanation of what's happening. This isn't haunted. This, this is something that you might want to think about. I'll never tell somebody their place is haunted because I don't know. Right. I don't know if haunting yeah. exists or not. I, I am, I am a skeptical. I'm probably more skeptical than most people you'll see in this. And we have to walk in there. It's okay. Yes. Every person I know has, lives in a haunted house. They all tell me they live in a haunted house. Right. I've yet to walk into anybody's house and I go, yeah, your house is 100% haunted. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have. I can tell you. Okay, this happened. We can't explain it. This, 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 this happened. We can explain all this. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but as far as I know, I mean, we we try to help whatever these disembodied spirits. We try to help them, and we talk to them and say, look, you know, you, you can. It's okay to go on. You don't have to stay here. You're not stuck here. And a lot of times, these voices that I hear, um, they'll take me to places in people's houses where and, and the, we were we were doing something at the Hales Bar Dam outside of Chattanooga one time and I heard this girl's voice talking the entire time. It led me into this room. We walked in this room, I found a little a marble and a coin and nobody knew where it came from. But I I picked it up, I took it to where this place was telling me to take it, I put it in the little hole and buried it. I know it sounds stupid, it sounds like something out of Scooby Doo. But I did it, voices stopped, we had no problems. Yeah. You know, it's weird crap like that. Right. You know, I wish I could explain it. I, I have no idea. All I know is it's very, very odd. Uh -huh. It's very, very strange. Um, you know, but <laughs> I love doing it because I, I, like I said, we'll, we'll sit through hundreds and thousands of hours of nothing. Right. To get that one moment where you go, all right, freak that. Right. <laughs> and, and there, to, to get the chicken skin, to yeah, get the, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, some of these places um, that you hear about that you should go and investigate, yeah, um, you know, uh, if you get a chance to go to, to Brushy. Right. Yeah. My, I've had multiple family members have gone multiple times, some claiming to have experiences, uh, for sure, and then my wife um, being able to help create an enhanced experience. Yeah. Um, because her and her... I don't want to say analytical mind, but she also has that deviousness, but also is very observant about things and noticed how the, the orientation of the light switches were sure. on the wall and waited until uh, her sister and their niece got into one of the cells that you can actually get into. Oh, no. And they're standing there, and of course my niece is one of those oh, who's yeah. uh, uh, a huge fan of a lot of the different shows and stuff like that. So my wife is like just sitting there just waiting for the right time and, and my niece says just the right thing and she just flips the switch to the lights. And everyone and, dies. And everyone, yeah. 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 and everyone freaks out. Yeah. As much as much time as we spend being reverent in places and, and, and 
searching for stuff. Um, most paranormal investigators, most paranormal teams are some of the worst practical jumpers you've ever seen. <laughs> oh, um, for, just for the jump factor oh, yeah. on anything. And the thing is, is we get really, really cool places to do that in. So yeah. Right. You know, we were in the middle of, uh, we were in the middle of uh, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital one time, which, oh. if, again, if you get a chance to go, one of my top three places to ever visit. Old South okay. Pittsburgh Hospital outside of, in, in Old South Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Tennessee, outside of uh, Chattanooga. It is ridiculously haunted. One of the most, one of the most uh, uh, paranormal, uh, odd places I've ever been in my life. We've seen things. That, only place I've ever seen a full body apparition. Oh wow! Uh, myself and, and three members of our team just walking, walking one night uh, about three thirty in the morning, just walking through the halls of the of the hospital, and suddenly we look, we hear a it sounded like a door slamming. We turn around and look, and we're kind of standing in a circle, and in the middle of our circle was what looked to be a 10 year old boy. Or at least his head and his shoulders, and then he kind of disappeared from his midsection. But he stood there and looked at all of us. He made eye contact with all four of us, and then looked over his left shoulder, which we all looked, and then looked back, and he was gone. Right. You know, I can't explain it. Yeah. I wish I could. We, got, we have a picture that I took where we saw what looks like him in that picture yeah. about oh, wow. seven hours earlier in the day standing outside the door with his hand in his mouth. It was, it was very odd. But uh, we were there at Old South Pittsburgh. Great place. Wonderful place. Um, but again, like I said, it's one of those places that because of TV, everyone's been there, so now they charge an arm and a leg for you to go down. Yeah. Right. It's privately owned, and they charge ridiculous amounts of money for you to go down there. If you want to spend the night there, you got to you got to open a home, a home loan. Um, <laughs> But uh, we were, of course, down in this, in this incredible uh, location, and, you know, I've got my team members, they found that one of the buzzers still worked. God. Oh, so wow. I waited until me and one of my other team were literally walking up, and we had just gotten, coming up from this, the, the downstairs basement area, which was freaky in its own, um, and they waited, they, they saw me on camera and waited until I passed the buzzer, and they hit the buzzer, and I screamed <laughs> completely nonsensical words which then morphed into uh, to, to non-family friendly words <laughs> and I just started running whereas my other team just laid on the ground and crying <laughs> he may have wet himself he oh have goodness but yeah no I'd say we, we, we love doing it and it's, it's always fun and like I said our, our team is very much like a family but you know we get these amazing places to go if you get a chance go to Old South Pittsburgh if you get a chance go to Waverly Hill Sanatorium mm. Uh, been to Waverly Hills. It is everything it's cracked up to be. That's that's one in Kentucky, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, Louisville. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is, and it is massively huge. Multiple multiple year waiting list. No, to, actually, no. Oh, okay. You can, you can usually get there in the off season, and, okay. it's, and it's not too bad. I mean, just to go up there and spend a few hours in the place. And the thing is, is every level, every place. There's certain. There's, it's so big. Every every floor has its own story and its own mythology and its own. Uh, uh, creatures that go with it, you know, whether yeah. it's the creeper, the, the creeper that haunts the third floor, or the the nurse who killed herself up on the fourth floor, or the, or the little boy, area. yeah, right. Um, you know, uh, you can stand there. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. We, last time we were there was in uh, late spring, early spring, late late winter, early spring. Beautiful night. It was warm. It was just gorgeous. We decided to go do one more walk through this before we're leaving. And suddenly we're walking, and, th- and that's it, for anybody out there that doesn't Waverly Hills. It's the one, it's the sanatorium. It was a former sanatorium. Upwards of ten thousand people or more died there. Uh, it's the one that has the death chute that goes down below, where they would cart the bodies out so they wouldn't cart them out in front of the patients. But it's basically it was a place where a lot of people who had tuberculosis yeah. would go to, in reality, would go to die. Yeah, and they did some horrific experiments on them try to cure them but but very very few of them ever actually there were children there there were there were families there um but uh, uh one side of the building is completely open to the end that was designed that way so that people could sit in their rooms and get air and then the other side of the building is closed rooms where they would basically once they knew that they were in their last days they would move them over to the close side yeah. and let them die in the closed room we were walking through completely clear it was nice like i said it was warmer than usual we came back out, we closed stuff up, making one last walk through. As we're walking down, suddenly the entire side of the, the, the room we were in, the entire closed side, was full of fog. Completely wow. foggy. 
We walked over to the open side. It's clear. There is nothing. Huh. There's huh. literally fog in just one entire row down the, down the hallway. And I mean, when I say hallway, it's several hundred yards long. So we start to walk. We get about three quarters. We get about a quarter of the way in. There's still three quarters of the hallway to go. And the person I'm with, we both looked at each other. I said, I can't, I can't take another step in here because I'm about to turn and run. Uh -huh. Yeah, just the, the... Well, it was just a weird feeling. And the thing is, I don't get scared on, on, on any of our investigations. It does, these things don't really frighten me. Um, but I suddenly had this urge. Something in my head said, you need to go now because you're about to be in a lot of trouble. And she looked at me and she goes, I'm getting the same thing. We have to leave now. We didn't have anything running except for a digital audio tape. So you hear us turn and start to walk, and you hear our footsteps go faster. And then if you listen to the audio tape, you start to hear other footsteps basically Ooh. around us. Oh. So we mainly, we basically made the 50-yard dash back to the door as you're hearing more and more footsteps join us on the audio tape. We hit the door and literally came through the door and shut the door as we felt the door push back up against us. Mm. Went and grabbed the rest of the team and said, come on, come on, this is freaking out. We turned around and walked back in and it was completely clear again. Something That's threatening. Crazy. Something was, literally chased us. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Something said it's time for you to go. We're done. Yeah. And then everyone was like, okay, whatever. So we told them. They said, okay, it's weird. So we went back to the safe room. Every 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 team has a safe room, which is the funniest moniker because it's, it's just the room that has the lights on. There's nothing safe about it. It's the room where the light is on. So we go to the safe room, we're packing everything up, we're getting ready to leave. There was about 10 of us there. And everything was un, was unplugged. The batteries were all out of the walkie-talkies. There was a walkie sitting there. The walkie-talkie case was still open. We were counting, making sure everything was there. All the walkies were there. All the batteries were out. One of the walkies, which again, had no battery in it. I know because we picked it up and looked, there was no battery in it. Suddenly clicked, we heard, we heard the squelch on the walkie-talkie, and somebody went, bye. <sighs> and then we, heard some, then we heard funky little music playing, and then it was done. Okay. Walk over the walkie, pick it up, oh, there's no battery in it. It's right. not on. There's, not, there's no power to this. Just, so we heard it. Just, just a just bye. Just a bye. Just a, okay. Of a, of a song, and then it was done. Wow. Okay. Well, they said bye to us. And and just the the, the energy to be able to to pull off something oh, like yeah. that. Just and with as what much stuff as, as much stuff as we had already experienced there at Waverly throughout the night, that was the that was the capper. For yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Here we go. Woo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Successful trip. Yeah. <laughs> but so my son is a part of our team. My son, when we were at Waverly, uh, for some reason, my son and I end up getting a lot of physical manifestations and stuff. He gets scratched all the time on his neck. Um, mm. But he goes down and, and challenges oh, whatever's okay, down there. Okay. So he's standing in the desk shoe saying, hey, show me something. I don't believe you're here to do something. And then about an hour later, we're walking behind him and notice three scratches on the back of his neck. Just nasty claw yeah. marks. Wow. Uh, when we were at Hales Bar Dam one night, I was challenging. And there was a story of, a, of a, one of the dam workers there uh, while the dam was being built. They ended up getting caught in an extramarital, extramarital affair uh, with a 15-year-old girl. He gets her pregnant, kills her, buries her body in a hole at the dam while they're building it, takes the fetus out, buries the fetus outside in a hole as well. Um, so there's a room where her body was found uh, where there's toys and, and dolls. Uh, we went down to the room where he supposedly worked. Um, and oddly enough, uh, the, the obelisk kept telling us his name was Mike. Ooh. So I said, hey, Mike, I said, you, you give all of the, the rest of us a bad name because you're a coward. I said, you, you know, you, 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 you killed a 15-year-old girl and then killed a baby. I said, you know, why don't you do something with me since you're, since you're a big tough guy? Yeah. So I stood there and did that for about 15 minutes. Uh, we were getting something in the corner. It looked like a... It's, it's one of those moments where I describe it where you, where you look in the dark, but you see something that's darker than the rest of the dark around it. Yeah. Um, and it's a very unsettling. It literally looked like something in the corner just staring back at us. Uh, every time we'd flash a light over there, we'd get nothing. But then as soon as you get the light away, it kind of came back. So finally we said, okay, you're not doing anything, so we're leaving. I started to walk out of the room, and something punched me in the middle of my back. It knocked me to my knee, knocked my breath out. We got up, went back again to the safe room. Um, I pulled my shirt up, took a picture, 
and you can see four distinct knuckle marks in the middle of my back or something. Wow. Punch me as Jeez. Hard as could. So yeah, things like that. We waited until your your back was turned though. Count right. it. Yeah. yeah. We waited until I was walking out the door. Yeah. yeah. But things like that, that is what for us makes it all incredibly amazing. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll pay the amount of money to go investigate these places. We'll sit for hours on end and, and get nothing just for something like that. Yeah. And then we go, okay, there's something there. What it is, I have no idea. Right. I wish I knew. I wish I could understand. Um, but yeah, and we, we use the term um, residual hauntings and, and yeah. intelligent hauntings. Um, a lot of the stuff that we get, a lot of the stuff that people see, especially at battlefields, especially at murder scenes, things like that, I think a lot of that is residual haunting. Basically, it's as if you took a tape recorder or a video recorder and recorded something and you just play it back over and over. It's almost like it's stuck in time there. Mm-hmm. Because there's so much emotion, because there's so much anguish, pain, whatever attached to that, it literally freezes it in time. Like a, like a death loop of yeah, some it sort. Yeah, it plays it over and over and over again. That's why people see when they go to... Gettysburg, they see soldiers marching mm-hmm. across the field, or they'll hear gunshots, or they hear cannonade, you know, um, or you'll see soldiers just standing there uh, in, in, in bloody bandages. It's like they're stuck in time, and they can't, they they don't really see you, they don't notice you're there, it's almost like they're just there showing you, okay, here, this is what happened. Yeah. This is like frozen in time. Those are amazing to get, but when you get those intelligent things, when you get those things that seem to react to you, answer questions or they hit you or scratch you or pull your hair or do the stuff then you go oh, what the hell's going on right. something's happening um, and yeah that's that's what makes doing what we do so much fun and that's what you know and like I said anybody you know, who will sit there and say okay this is definitive black and white your house is haunted this is this this is a demon following you um, and again I'm describing everything that Zach does on, on yes. Ghost Hunters do you hear that he said my name no 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 yeah. nothing's saying your name Right. Anybody who records something that says, hey, it says this, they don't know what they're doing. Right. If you truly want to have somebody listen to something you do, just play and go, here, what do you hear? Yeah, what right. Because I guarantee you, you'll probably, you might hear something different. You might, yeah. but if we all sit and listen to the same thing and we all hear the exact same thing, then there's something. It's it's a it's a salesman or a magician's sure. trick to, to sure. um, um, train or yeah. to... to I mean, we do it here Almost, sometimes. Yeah, for sure. When we're sampling, we're like, you, what you're tasting is da 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 da, and that can sure. be sometimes like, oh, it is what I'm tasting. Yeah. It is absolutely what I'm tasting. As opposed to asking, yeah, what do you taste? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it is, and it, it's leading people into something. I mean, I, I spent years as a bartender. Conditioning. It's conditioning. conditioning. Yeah. Yes. I know, you, as spending years as a bartender, I can get somebody drunk off a glass of water if I keep telling them what they're drinking. Yeah. Very alcoholic. And they'll eventually start to show signs of being yeah. drunk until you go, oh, that isn't really. Oh, okay, fine. Oh. So if I sit there and tell you, hey, it said my name, hey, it said my name, hey, it said my name, hey, it's a demon, hey, it's a demon, it's not. Right. It's not. And it, it, I think it's very, you know, it, it, it's very sad when you have somebody like that that says, oh, it's a demon, it's a demon. No, no, no. Yeah. If you're dealing with something that's very demonic, and we've dealt with a few things that were, that could be classified as demonic, it's on a whole different level. Yeah. Right. It's, I mean, you're comparing. It's not, it's not on TV. Kids, it's at a whole level. You're, you're comparing kids peewee football to the NFL. Yeah. You know. Just because you say, oh, it's a demon, it's a demon. No, it's not a demon. Is it now, is there a, a moment where, like, if you're like, okay, we've reached that demonic level, and you're like, we're done? There have been some cases where we've had to call, you know, where we've called members of the religious community saying, mm-hmm. hey, we think this is what's going on, or hey, this might be a case of possession. Um, and, yeah, and, and there's actually been stuff that has happened to some to myself and some other members of the, uh, of the team Um there's actually a local haunt outside of Knoxville um, uh, that uh, we went and did an uh, investigation of um, where on camera for about an hour and a half, uh, I don't really remember much of what happened, but I, I, at one point they were holding the EMF to me. There were three EMFs being held to me, and so the EMFs were all going crazy. It felt like I was asleep most of the time, but there was like, just very strange things. I was doing very strange things. Strange things were happening. It's like something just kind of came in and went, hey, I'm going to go ahead and take you over. Yeah. And we had some very odd things that night. Um, so, yeah, and, it, and it's one, and luckily one of our, now here's where it sounds crazy again, because uh, all of this, all of this sounds crazy, because none of this stuff makes any sense. Uh, one of our, one of our members of our team um, is actually, she's a witch. 
Okay. She's a white witch. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't mean she's, you know, she doesn't ride on her own broomstick. She doesn't <laughs> wear a pointy hat. Yeah. Uh, she doesn't look like Glenda. She, uh, she just, she is knowledgeable in uh, a lot of different spells and incantations and blessings and things like that to help. And she, she'll come and she'll clean the house for us. And she'll do things to help people. When we get done, when we get done with our investigations all the time, she's the one that does our sage. Uh, yeah. She sages us after we're done, things like that. So you don't take anything with you? Yeah, yeah. And that, and, and even that, I mean, and I tell people, if you're going to go do this, the, one of the easiest ways, because I don't want anything, oh, I hear all the time, I don't want anything to attach themselves to me, I don't want to take home. Then literally, as you walk out of there, before you get in your car, before you leave, you literally say out loud, you're not allowed to stay with me, you've got to stay here. That, 99% of the time. Mm. If it's a demon, nope. it probably won't work. <laughs> It'll come with you. You know, and you'll know if you're running into something demonic, because there's a there is again a totally different uh, thing. And I, you know, after twenty some odd years of doing this, we have maybe come across it one or two times. Yeah. And even those are very low level, very very small. But I mean, when you 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 can tell when you've crossed over into that line because it's something completely different. And it's totally different than what you see in movies. It's not some big attack, no. and you're like. Exercising it, and yeah. it's it. Movies it's really, have also kind of run that for. Yeah, it's really more of a feel and a psychological thing. You mm-hmm. can kind of feel it in the pit of your stomach. What's going on? I mean, you know, the the, the spirits and the weird stuff like that. What happens at Waverly? That's actually kind of fun and exciting. Yeah. The demon, the demonic stuff. It, it, I mean, you can feel it. I mean, it, it makes you feel sick. It makes you just yeah. It's it's you're just kind of like ugh. It's it almost like it drains all the energy out. Of yeah. You. Um, and it's it's very and you can feel it. You can just feel the darkness of it. You feel how dark it is. Um, so yeah, I mean it's. I love it. It's, it's yeah. something I love doing. Um, even now, where where I work, I work at a major theme park. Um, one of the theaters we work in. Um, in fact, many of the theaters there, and, and, and you know as well as I do, OP. If you spend any time in the theater, every theater has some sort of legend, some sort of ghost, some sort of feeling to it. And I think, I don't think so much of the, that it's because of something, somebody that's died there, but it's because when you get actors and creative people in a place that spend six, 12, you know, weeks, whatever time, and they pour all themselves, they pour all yeah. their ideas, they pour all their emotions into this one project, it leaves kind of this, this ball of energy there. And I think it kind of stays there and it creates these things. It's almost like that It's almost like that residual haunting thing where it kind of leaves this recording of whatever happened there. And you do it over enough years and you start to get these things. You get stuff that goes bump in the night and stuff that turns lights on and off and stuff that sounds like people are walking across the stage when there's nobody there in the stage. Yeah. Um, and then like with any good ghost story, if you can combine that with, uh, you know, with, with any local myths or with any local stories or any type of mythological or uh, you know any any type of idea of a story of something that you can kind of place in there then you suddenly create a ghost yeah and you create a great ghost story I'm glad you came back around to that because that's one of the questions that even watching the shows and stuff like that and you you touched on it a little bit as far as going into the research mm-hmm. behind trying to find that is is how difficult some of that stuff can be like trying to track down i mean yeah it, it's easy to to do a google search sure. on something or stuff like that but to actually try to go back to whenever records weren't as great exactly. records weren't kept as well uh trying to trace back some of these different things how difficult and then also like how much of this stuff goes to where it's not like public access or public domain to be able to get some of these different pieces of information like you have to actually go through the court system and stuff like yeah, that to, get to be able to get access to you know, and, and that's part of what of my job is as a, as a case manager if, if someone's approaching us and saying hey we, we can you come do this or if we're going to go do a big investigation somewhere part of what i do is i go and do a lot of the backstory i'll do some of the uh, history of the place what we're looking at you know any historical stuff that i can pull and as great as the internet is now and as great as Google and all these, these, these search engines are, the thing we have to remember is somebody has, have to have, somebody has to have put something in there to begin with yeah. right. in order for us to find it. A lot of the stuff you can find, but it does go up to a certain point. And if you're looking at stuff that's, you know, uh, you know, sometimes prehistoric, sometimes pre-civilization, sometimes, you know, 
uh, Indian lore or pre-Civil War, then it starts to get a little sketchy. Then mm -hmm. it starts to get a little weird. Uh, or stuff that maybe, you know, it wasn't a big, big story, but it was something that people passed down and told around locally. You really can't find. Like, like the, the, the theater I just mentioned that, that I work at, um, there's we have a legend in there, and we, we talk about it, and I've heard from people before I went there about, and we refer, we refer to her as the little ghost girl. And the thing is, it's it's a perfect example of a of a legend and a myth that has some basis in truth, but we can't find all all the points of the the picture to complete the whole yeah. picture. You know, we've got the thousand piece puzzle, but a hundred pieces are missing. You know, so we got well, most of it, but there's some of the important parts we can't find. Okay. Um, so. Where this theater is, where this, this theme park is, there used to be a campground, and apparently where the theater sits now, it's a low, sit, low, low part of the, the, the landscape, there used to be a pool there, and the pool was at one point a community pool, and it was part of this campground, um, and I know that there was a pool there because we've had people who said, oh yeah, I went to school over here, and we actually used that pool as our swimming pool, or I've been in that pool in the summer times when it was just a park or when it was a, a campground. Well, apparently, at one point, they closed the pool because the pool kept flooding all the time. Um, and the best we can find out is they didn't really remove the pool. They just filled the pool up, put more concrete over it, and then ended up building this, this building over top of it, which then eventually became this theater. So you have this basis of, okay, we know there was a pool there. We know that it flooded a lot. We know that, that people knew that this pool there. Now we know that, that this building's here. Well, then you add in the mythology of it. So the building that was there kept flooding. To this day, it still floods on occasion. Well, mm. So rather than saying, okay, well, it's a low wing part of the, the landscape, no, no, it floods because the pool's still there and the pool's still drawing all this water to it. It's this, it suddenly takes on this mythological thing. Yeah, okay. The, water's keep, the water keeps coming into this building it's being because of the there pool. By the pool. The yeah. still there underneath. It. And from what we understand, the pool's directly underneath where the stage is. So then suddenly you add into what's the biggest fear that parents and kids have if they're at a public pool? Drowning. Someone's gonna drown. Yeah. Suddenly somewhere along the way <laughs> Well there was this there was this uh band aid. Yeah. Somewhere along the way, somebody probably drowned or almost drowned in this pool. That's uh, probably a given. Because okay. it was yeah. there for some time. Right. We can't find a story where somebody actually died, but we know somebody probably, because we've heard people say, oh yeah, I remember there was a little girl that drowned there. I remember, the, yeah, I think it was, I heard about this little girl. So suddenly this, this, this lore, this, this, this story that was passed around to everybody that they heard about this little girl who drowned there suddenly becomes, well, there was a little girl that drowned in the pool, that's why they, that's why they closed the pool. So then you add in the fact that we now have a theater there that floods. It floods at different times of the year. And suddenly, I'm there working at night, and they'll, and, and now here's here's where it gets weird, because here's where I don't know if it, this is something that actually has happened, and there's some residual spirit there, or this is the Slender Man effect. A man enough people have yeah. have believed in it enough that we've created this thing that is now running around there. I'm like a Tulpa. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's using the energy that the like you said the sure. performers and entertainers sure. and stuff like that just came in and poured into the building. Yeah. But because, like you say, so many people have so now many cast, focused so many in have, on have mentioned the little ghost girl, the little ghost girl, the little ghost girl, and I can be I'll be the first to say I have sat there at night. I have closed the entire theater. I'm closing up. I'm walking out in the evening, um, and I'll hear what sounds like a kid's footsteps running down one part of the hallway, and you hear a giggling. You hear, I hear a giggling kid running down the hallway and it sounds like wet feet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or you'll stand on stage. Last night I was leaving there last night. I was w literally walking across the stage and immediately, you can see. Goosebumps again. Somebody was sitting out in the hall in, in, the, in the audience just staring at me. I knew they were. And something in my head said, don't turn around and look, just go. Just keep going. Right. Because I knew if I turned around and looked, there was something sitting there staring at me. Right. I don't know what it was. I have no clue. Something. But Something. I went, okay, I'm just going to walk out. I walked out of the door. I went, good night. I'll go to the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so. Th th that for the uh, now Array Theater, yes. uh, formerly the 
Civil War theater, yeah. formerly, formerly the, the formerly the formerly the, formerly, the, formerly <laughs> the going all the way back to the seventies, whenever it was a uh, um, water fountain show. Yeah, uh, what is like I said, the Array Theater there in Pigeon Forge has it almost oh, yeah. word for word uh, what that is yeah. or what story you just told, and, and it just seems like the the likelihood of oh yeah, of that is, is more likelihood. Yeah. Of being the case, sure. oh well, and the story that has been told at least was told to me. Oh, there was this kid that really loved coming and watching the the show, who developed some sort of whatever and died at yeah. a young age. So that's the yeah. the the energy. That's yeah. the the thing that you're seeing under the stage or that you're experiencing. Sure. Well, even with my, during my time things. at Hatfield, we had all of our the stories that were told about you know the woman that you would hear or hear walking right up on you. Oh, I, yeah. I have my own story, you know. Right. With, it felt like someone walking right I, up on my on I my haunches. Was a, just I, was, I, too, was at Hatfield. We actually yeah. covered th- supposedly three different spirits. The uh, different the maintenance guy. I can't remember his name. Yes. An, an, an the smoke. And, a, and yep. for some reason, a little girl. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, yep. the little girl used to say my name. The, yeah, the maintenance I'm guy not, is... is is the, well, you smell the cigarette smoke, yeah. and and you can he'll he'll touch he'll yeah all those stories like cousin Timmy used to tell us like you know oh no I had an interaction with the maintenance guy the other night and it oh, was yeah. it was not fun and I'd be like yeah. okay so you're still there cool uh, <laughs> you know yeah, Tim, uh, Tim and I have talked about the little girl before because there there were times when I'd be closing up at night and I'd be walking out and all of a sudden as I'm walking down the back hall down the back of the other end of the hall I'd hear my and so I, to the point where I'd walk back and go, hey, is there something right here? I'd walk through, you know, maybe. Right. There's a little kid. Mike. The EVP I still have. We were doing it with Stephen and Tim Harker World. We were doing an investigation there that night. I'm telling Stephen my interaction. I was like, I'm going to the, the soft drink machine over here, and I feel like someone's walking, like, on the back of my feet, and I turn around and nobody's there. Well, while you hear me talking on the EVP, you hear me going, I'm doing this, and on. you hear Stephen go, yeah, yeah. And then you hear this girl's voice go, with me? just this with me and I when I played it back I was like okay yeah. okay. right okay yeah. just and I think with that her that there's right. a potential for that to be a collection like yeah. the uh, Tony sure. Tony this guy. Yes, the Tony, guy yes yeah. um, that's an actual like yeah. that is him as potentially a, a an intelligent sure. energy still going around the little girl potentially being more of a Built a built, yeah. and then and I think a and lot then of the, the woman. I think a lot I'm of those sure. things are like that. I think you, where you'll have a collection of things where you have maybe an actual intelligent or uh, a residual haunting combined with you know this mythological creature, this creation that we've made combined with whatever, so that after so many years it builds its own thing. So you you know it's hard to tell the difference between Tony or the little girl. Yeah. Or this mysterious woman, or this smell here, or yeah. this sound over here. So you get this this mix of all of them. The weird thing with ours is that we have a little ghost girl. Sure, probably made up. Sure, I don't know if it ever actually happened. But the weirdest thing we have in that theater is we have a water stain on one of our curtains because it. it that's the other thing too. That leaks. The, the building leaks. Oh yeah. And as many times as we keep trying to fix it over there, it continues to leak. And again, it, it feeds into that mythos of, well, the water has to come in. It has to come into this building. Right. Well, we now have, and we've had this, this stain on this curtain for as long as I've been there. But you pull the curtain open, look at it, and it swear, you swear up and down, it's the, it's the shadow of a, it, it looks like the body of about an eight-year-old girl, you know, in a bikini standing there. Oh, wow. And it's just this, and it's this water stain that has permanently stained this curtain. Hmm. It won't go away, but you look at it, and it looks like a little skinny eight-year-old girl in a bikini standing there, and it just happens to sit. If you believe the, the, the legend, it's the, where that curtain sits is at the very edge of the pool where she supposedly fell in the ground. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. So crazy. She, so she stands to watch there yeah. always. Yeah, she stands to watch. And it's the first thing you see as you walk in the back door. And you look over, and there she is, standing in the corner. That's wild. Now you mentioned that you you just finished up a podcast as well. Yeah, uh, ETGS. We uh, we actually had a couple different podcasts that spanned over about five years, and um, we just uh, unfortunately, like like uh, podcasts have a way of doing, and like uh, ghost hunting has a way of doing. Sometimes real life gets in the way, and you just start to run out of the uh, 
the time to do it. But we have, you can find it, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, Google East Tennessee Ghost Seekers and find all, all the different years mm -hmm. of our podcast. And we talk a lot about our uh, investigation. We also talk a lot about uh, things like cryptids and, and UFOs. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, absolutely, uh, I, I adore cryptids. I think cryptids are amazing. Yeah. Those along, you know, I can't, I can't read enough about the Mothman. Or right. See stuff about the Mothman or Nessie. Yeah. Or any of these things because there's some again, how much of it is legend, how much of it is based in truth? Because there's something that spurred that. Right. What is that? Uh -huh. uh, another huge surge in um, anything uh, Gigantopithecus yeah, related. Bigfoot. With Bigfoot. We actually uh, uh, we just renamed our vodka Tennessee Wildman. Because it's such yep. a, sure, it's a thing. It's especially around here. Oh sure, and, and we're big into cryptids. Yeah, something uh, that I've been seeing on you know different social media platforms quite a bit more, uh, different sightings, different you know new sightings, new video footage. Mm -hmm. You know how much of it is truth, how much of it sure. is just complete crap, all of that stuff. Uh, before we get you out of here, uh, we don't want to take up too much more yeah. of your time. Um, you gave us number three on your list. Where's number one? Um, let's see, so uh, Old South Pittsburgh's number three. Uh, Waverly Hills has got to be number one. Waverly Hills has got to be number one. Wow. Just all-around experiences in general. Yeah. Like yeah, just, I mean, just because they're so, again, because of the size and scope of the place or because of the different types of interactions you'll get there and the different, um, oh, and number two would be Hales Bar and Dam. Okay. Uh, yeah, you've mentioned it multiple yeah. times. Yeah, Hillsborough is fantastic. Um, but uh, yeah, num number one would be would be Waverly Hills, just because it lives it lives up to all the hype. It's one of those places. It's one of those you know, as as a uh, paranormal investigator and ghost hunter, whatever you want to call them, uh, that's one of those places that, that's on everybody's bucket list. It's it lives up to every single bit of that bucket list because it changes every single time you walk into it. The the rooms change the. The, the feeling changes. Everything changes with that place. You can walk in there for an hour one time, wait a couple minutes, go back in the same place, and it's completely changed. You know, um, the last time we were there, like I said, we, we got chased out of there. There was also during that time um, my son running the camera and, and then one of our team members staying there. Here we are in a tuberculosis sanatorium, and suddenly both of them start showing signs of uh, final days, final hours of of tuberculosis. Oh, uh, just the like a, like a ghost sickness type. One of them, them yeah. couldn't stop coughing, couldn't breathe. Yeah. And my son started just violently throwing up. Wow. And it literally came upon them immediately. And like it came a, upon both of them at the same time. Wow. Like a ghost sickness, like you start yeah. living out. Well, but the weird thing was, they were walking through. It was fine. They walked into, we walked into one of the known rooms, and it was one of the death rooms. It was one of the rooms toward the back that was closed up. And the minute they walked in there, both of them started showing these signs, and to the point where Elsie had to walk out of the room because he couldn't catch his breath. He couldn't stop coughing. And then Justin looked at me and he goes, he goes, here. And he hands me the camera and he literally ran to the other side of the building and started throwing up on the side of the building. Jeez. And then, I looked at, and then once I got out of the room, they were fine. fine. They were fine. So again, how much, is that, is, how much of that is actual something taking over? How much of that is the human mind going, hey, this is where you're standing now? And how much of that is when you step in this room, sometimes this happens to people and they still don't believe it. Yeah, you know that's the amazing thing about about getting to do this is just you really look at okay, how much of this am I going to believe? How much of this am I going to buy? How much of, how much of this am I, am I going to call BS to? Um, and then you just kind of go with an open mind and go, all right, let's see what happens. And then when it happens, you go, oh, okay, what just happened? That's really awesome. But yeah, Waverly Hills lives up to every single bit of the hype, every single bit of the. Everything you ever thought it was, it'll blow your mind to be that much more. Just as a Stephen King fan, chance to get out to the Stanley? I would love to. I would love to. I mean, there there are so many places on my list I would love to go. And and, and I only name my top three just because these are the places I've been. Actually um, been. Uh, but, yeah, I would love to go to the Stanley. Uh, I would love to go to Moundsville. I would mm. love to go to, uh, 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 up to, to Mansfield uh, Reformatory. Uh, I would love to uh, head out to uh, Villisca, to the Villisca Axe House. Um, uh, I've done, uh, I, I, I've done uh, a couple places out west. Um, got to go walk around outside of the uh, outside of the Tate LaBianca House, um, and, or, or the LaBianca House, and then over by where the, 
the Tates live, the, the Manson family murders. Um, and a lot of these places, I mean, they all have, the cool thing about them is they all have an energy to them. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't go away. You know? um, I was in my 20s, I lived out in Los Angeles, and I, I worked two and a half miles from the old Spahn Ranch, where Charlie and his family lived. Wow. And I snuck out there one night and walked around. The place is terrifying. It is still to this day an absolutely terrifying place. You're two miles from Topanga Canyon Boulevard and, and the lights and, and, and sounds of Los Angeles. But you go two miles and you're literally stuck in 1965 in California and you're waiting for somebody to pop out with a, with a, with a knife and slit your throat. It is terrifying. Jeez. It is terrifying. And it still holds that energy there. It's, just, you, I mean, it's one of those places, it's just, it's just dark. You walk yeah. on there, and it's just dark. It could be the middle of the afternoon, you walk on there, and it's just dark. Like these towns that you just see completely frozen in time, sure. where it's yeah. been the, the... I'm trying to reference a, a, a Supernatural episode. Oh, like the old Lawrence, Kansas ghost oh, yeah. town. Yeah, where everybody just all of a sudden just disappears like just left, for whatever right? reason. Yeah. Everybody just leaves from this town, and... and and there's and just, just that, that aura, sure. that energy that's still there. I mean, the only thing I can and literally replicate it to, and it's because, again, places I've been, um, if you get a chance to go to Europe, if you get a chance to go to Poland and, vi- and visit um, Auschwitz or any of the, any Ooh, of the yeah. uh, concentration camps, again, bright, sunshiny day, you literally, the minute you walk on there, it's suddenly just, whew, the sound sucks away, energy sucks away, everything is just, it's like it's frozen in time. Mm. literally moving through a moment in time you know and you're just like okay and because there's so much pain and suffering that happened in this one spot it literally sucks everything else out of there and it it, it almost creates a vortex you know that's the easiest way to describe it these places almost create a vortex and when you walk into them Waverly Hills being the same thing because there was so much death there it creates this vortex when you walk in it could be 98 degrees outside you walk into this place and it's freezing cold I, I can't even begin yeah. to imagine. Yeah, it's freezing cold, and you just and you go and you know that you're surrounded by just a lot of stuff that isn't there anymore. Yeah, you know, it's like a void. It's literally a void in, in, in the world. There, there are so many more questions, uh, and I could sit here and listen to you talk about this stuff all day long for hours. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, even going into a, another question that I would have. Um, um, best tangible piece of evidence that you guys have have actually gotten either a, a video, an audio. I we when we were at uh, uh, and it's actually on our on our video page, uh, East Tennessee Ghost Seekers on uh, on YouTube. <laughs> I'm glad you hit that too because I was yeah. gonna East make sure that you got those in there. East, East Tennessee Ghost Seekers on uh, when you search on YouTube, we uh, we we we've done several investigations that we've turned into documentaries. We film, we, we try to film everything that we can and then we, we go back and, and, and put it together in about a 90 minute form. We were walking through uh, Old South Pittsburgh, uh, myself and Stephen, uh, one of our founding members. We were down, there was maybe six of us down in the kitchen area walking around and um, suddenly, it, it, and we, we caught it on the video audio. No one in the room heard it. And you can see us on the video. No one reacts to it. But in the video audio, as we're talking, you suddenly hear a woman scream. It is a blood-curdling, horrible scream. It sounds like somebody falling from a great height. And you hear the death rattle at the end of the scream. And it goes on for a good three or four seconds. And you hear the death rattle at the end, and it just finishes. And none of us react to it. But we caught it, and it's clear as day. You can get wow. caught it clear as day on, on, on the video audio. Um, in fact, several, and several of those things. Um, having the Ovilus, when we're in, and we, we have it again recorded most of the stuff on, on YouTube. Um, walking into a, a bathroom at a, re, at a radio station and asking with the Ovilus on, we're sensing a dark presence, who is this? And you hear the obelisk say in a very cheery voice, the devil. <laughs> huh. You know? I mean, just very odd stuff. Just weird stuff. We do have some video as well of a little girl we caught uh, in one of the rooms at, uh, at uh, Hale's Bar. As the camera's panning. We literally see a little girl just kind of standing in the corner of the room. And then we 
pan back and there's nobody there. I know what I'm doing on my lunch break. Right? I'm going to the <laughs> I'm going to the YouTube page. But we we chased this little girl around the room for maybe 20 minutes. And yeah, she just kept avoiding us, and all of a sudden we pan the camera back, and you see her standing in the corner, right, looking back Playing. at us. And we came back, and she's gone. You know. But again, some of the stuff that we experienced that we weren't able to catch. Uh, Steve and I walking through Hales Bar one night, and there were vents, grates on the wall. And as we walked by one of the grates, it was a ventilation grate. He, he he was in front of me. I was right behind him. We both looked down at the bottom of the grate and saw four fingers in the bottom of the grate, and they kind of slid back in. Right. Uh. <coughs> and he stopped, and I looked down, and I went, "What?" He goes, "Yeah, I saw it too." <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it, it's weird stuff like that. And you go, "Okay." Right. Either somebody's messing with us hard. Yeah. Right. Or there's something to this, and, I, and I, I'm here to say, I think there's, I think there's something to some of this. Yeah. But. Unlike Zach Baggins, they're not all demons. Yeah, right. They're not all saying Zach's name. Yeah. <laughs> but there is something out there. <laughs> Zach the demon daddy. Yeah. And more power to him. He is a great television celebrity. He is. Uh, yes. yes. But that's what He's he a is. great that's personality. He's not a demonologist. He's a television celebrity. Exactly. Absolutely. From Las Vegas. That's right. Now, his, his team, some of the best guys in the business. Like Aaron and them? Aaron and them, some of the best people in the business. Yeah. Which is which makes me again angry at Zach about the way he treats him the way he does. Right. Yes, and there's there's a lot of um, uh, para unity going on. Yeah. We're like realizing where Zach's been the bad guy. This oh, yeah. like what he did to oh yeah to Nick. Yeah. And what he did with to Dakota's show. Yeah. Kind of saying it's me or them. Yeah. He's he's in the last few months. He's he's shown his. Yeah. Karma. His yeah. He's, he's shown his true face. He's a TV celebrity. Yeah. And he's yeah. kind of a diva. Yeah. So. Mike, this has been amazing. We're definitely going to have you back on. Yes, absolutely. This is so much. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll this. try to bring the team with me next time. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to start talking about anything getting back into Native American, just oh, that, yeah. that type of, of old history and oh, energy. Sure. Uh, that's something that well, again, that's the, you got to you, you need to plan a, a trip down to Old South Pittsburgh because not only is Old South, Old South Pittsburgh, it was a hospital up until the mid-'80s when they closed it. Uh, it's on a... It's on an old Civil War battlefield, so you got that. It's over a giant limestone uh, water basin as well. So there's, a, there's an underground spring there, which which kind of creates. It makes basically makes like a spirit magnet, is what yeah. we call it. Uh, I'm sorry. Like the ley lines and yeah. stuff. Yeah, but it's it's also uh, a part of the Trail of Tears too. It's actually where they were where they moved oh. several of the Cherokee out. That um, much stuff in one place yeah. between all those different things. Yeah, I couldn't even... Yeah. It's actually, no wonder it was, it's... It was, a, it was one of the gathering points uh, for when they grabbed the, the Indians out of the, Ch- the, the Chattanooga area and got them into Oklahoma. So geez. there's all of that. And, and one of the things, if you watch the, the Old South Pittsburgh documentary on YouTube that we did, we actually pick up Indian drums at one point. <sighs> We're standing there talking. And we had the grandson of the chief down there with us. He's one of our team wow. members. And he'd never been there before, but something drew him to the, to go on that investigation with us. And we found out what it was. The minute he walked in the room, you start hearing... Thump, 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 thump. It, it recognizes. Yeah. The energy recognizes. Yeah, it was, it was his great-grandson. Wow. It was his great-grandson. That's uh, again, we, we're going to have to stop. Yeah. Otherwise, this is, we can be here all day. This is going to be a four-hour episode if we yeah. wanted to. Uh, as Opie said, Mike, we definitely, definitely appreciate you coming out and well, hanging out with us today. Uh, any other social media platforms or anything that no. uh, people can follow you on? Just the YouTube? Just, just YouTube. Uh, just search uh, East Tennessee Ghost Seekers and search us on YouTube and you can find us. Awesome. Opie, take us home. Thank you very much to our amazing guest, Mike. And uh, to those of you that are listening to another episode, uh, email us any our call to action, you know, if what you are your send, ghost stories? yes, if you send in a ghost story, email us your personal ghost story, and we'll get a swag package out to you. Uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, until next time, I'm Opie. I'm Brian. Cheers to you, legends. Folks, once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Between Two Barrels. And if you aren't getting enough of that legendary content, make sure and head on over to TennesseeLegend.com 
where you can find links to all of our different locations, as well as all of our different social media sites and our online swag shop. And until next time, stay legendary.